was told by Hilary DeVay at the time that I was stupid. Duncan Bannatyne told me I would never sell any. I'll tell you what, I'm, whenever I sell my millionth unit, I'm gonna send you each a special edition just to go, there you go, how's that? Which I did. <laughs> you were awarded a Distinguished Service Order. 2006, what was supposed to be just a meet and greet turned into quite a cheeky little situation. We were attacked by a number of Taliban, so 25 to 30 Taliban surrounding us. When we called for air support, there were no helicopters or fast air support available for us. So one of those life-defining moments, I realized actually now I need to raise my game. I'm Nick Haley, founder of Little Big Tech. After more than a decade in the army, I left and joined civilian life. In this podcast series, I'll be speaking to entrepreneurs who left military service and started the next exciting chapter in their lives. We'll hear how these inspiring individuals transitioned from active service to the world of business. How did they take the first step on the road to becoming an entrepreneur? We'll find out. Welcome to Little Big Vets, the veteran entrepreneurs podcast. In 2006, Sangin, Afghanistan, was one of the most dangerous places on earth. It was the epicenter of the British Army's ongoing battle with the Taliban. The soldiers of C Company 3 Para, part of the elite parachute regiment, were led by Major Paul Blair. They had orders to diminish the Taliban's influence in South Afghanistan and restore power to the Kabul government. It was a mammoth task, the impacts of which are still felt by all those involved. Paul, as a commander, was hit hard. Paul, thanks for joining us. Before we get into your career journey, what does your day look like today? Today started like most days recently. Um, rudely awakened at about 6.45 by my two dogs, uh, both wanting to um, get outside, get a bit of breakfast. And um, after I looked after them, uh, they went back to bed. But a um, cup of coffee and a quick sort of trawl through a to-do list and starting to think about, yeah, what, what jobs I had to do for the rest of the day. So, Paul, could you tell us about your career in the Army? I spent 20 years thereabouts in the Parachute Regiment. I actually started in the, what was 10 Para, the um, Parachute Regiment Reserve Battalion at the time. So it was a fantastic part-time job, um, did a lot of training. Um, so I did P Company. A uh, lot of infantry courses, uh, went to Sanders and was commissioned, um, did the uh, basic parachute course at Bryce Norton. Then towards the end of my degree, um, that experience, I suppose, reinforced my view to uh, join the regular army. So did all of those courses again, um, obviously, uh, second time around, I knew what was coming. I'm not sure if that made it um, <laughs> better or, or worse, but... Uh, over 20 years, I spent um, at least a couple of years, uh, one job in each of the parachute um, regiment battalions. I did seven operational tours in the end, and towards the end of that time, realised actually, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to stay in for as long as I could, and realised that I wanted a, a second career. So in 2012, I left to start and try and find a second career. And so... Uh... At the time when you were leaving, what sort of things were you thinking that you were going to go and do after you left? I had absolutely no idea. A lot of friends who had left at, at various stages were moving into the city, some into banking, um, one or two left to start their own businesses, which I thought was interesting. But actually, in my last two years, I had a personal experience that led to inadvertently starting starting the first business, the, which was Safe Sticks Dog Toys. So do you want to talk us through that story that uh, that took you there? Yeah, so we'd take our two little Jack Russells at the time and we'd always take them to the park and throw a ball for them. Um, quite often, if I didn't have a toy or a ball, I would pick up a stick. One particular occasion, I threw this uh, bit of a cack-handed throw and the stick launched into the ground or stuck into the ground, a bit like a javelin, just as... Uh, Razzle, uh, one of the Jack Russells, landed on it and I heard this crunch and realised he was injured. So thought the worst, checked him over really quickly. I could see a bit of blood, um, but took him to the local vets. I got the biggest bollocking of my life from the vet after he had, uh, he had checked the dog over. Thankfully, Razzle wasn't seriously injured, but the vet was telling me that, that dogs are, uh, or sticks rather, are really uh, dangerous for dogs. So many dogs um, are killed and injured uh, every year. 
And that was, I suppose, my little eureka moment, realizing that sticks were dangerous. I did a bit of market research, saw there was there was a gap in the market for a, a safe stick. And so I set about what was a three-year process of, of designing, developing, and bringing to market a um, safe stick. And so this happened while you were still in the army? Yes. So I spent evenings and weekends um, developing this product, trying to find a product designer, trying to find the right sort of material, um, and yeah, building the business very slowly, going out to mum and dad's pet shops all over Wiltshire and the, and the Southwest uh, with prototypes, trying to get some feedback, being told no, being laughed at sometimes and shown the door. And yeah, it took, uh, it took a long old process, but that, that sort of straddled um, the, my last two years and into my uh, first year after leaving. Just back to your military career a little bit. Um, can you talk us through some of the, the challenges you faced during your time in the army? Yeah, it was moving around, um, typical of um, uh, certainly a commission officer's career. Uh, it was a move every two years. And so certainly the first six months in every position was was learning the ropes. Uh, and it's a mix of um, commanding platoons, um, or units and also staff jobs, but certainly when, when soldiers were involved, you know, I felt it you know, a challenge to, first of all, gain the respect of those troops. It certainly wasn't, um, you know, wasn't taken for granted. And I felt as a commander, I needed to prove my competence and my, my ability. And then it was obviously um, trying to make sure my skill level was as good as it could be and being as prepared as possible to, to deploy on, on all those operational tours. Needless to say, you know, those tours were the, the biggest challenge of my career, each one in turn, lots of tours of Northern Ireland, then Kosovo, Sierra Leone, and then Afghanistan. And um, certainly coming under fire, that's when, yeah, those challenges really, really peaked. And uh, for everyone, but certainly me um, in a command position, yeah, that, that really was the, the, uh, the peak of, of challenge. So uh, just picking up on the, uh, the, the the constant new roles every couple of years and having to um, uh, ha- having to settle into a new role, do you think that uh, that constant changing prepared you well for an entrepreneurial life? Absolutely, there, there are pros and cons. Um, it is great for experience. Um, the British Army t- tends to to do that on a a two year rotation. So you spend the first six months learning the ropes, a year of probably adding value, and then the last six months uh, trying to wind up getting ready to hand over to your successor and looking towards your, your next role. But I think that that constant change and um, I suppose adaptability is is a fantastic foundation for um, yeah, the entrepreneurial world. And so uh, you, you mentioned Kosovo. Was that 99? It was, yes. Uh, I was there too. <laughs> Small world. There we go. Yeah, we probably crossed paths at some point. Um, so uh, when you when you'd made that decision to leave, um, what was what was that experience like from when you'd signed off to like your first sort of few months out of the army? I felt I was I was really lucky. So uh, I know it's it's a challenge for all of us in um, in uh, I suppose different stages and um, intensity. But I had what I thought was just the most fun job as my last few years, which was commanding the the Red Devils uh, free fall team. Um, There was a serious side to it. We are a um, high profile PR resource and recruiting resource for for the British Army as a whole and also the parachute regiment. But it was just a huge amount of fun. Uh, As the joke goes, you know, falling out of perfectly serviceable aircrafts. Uh, all over the UK and all over the world. So I'd eased out of that, I suppose, strict combat role, um, battalion or battle group sort of life. I I wasn't even wearing uh, combats. I spent most of my time in a, in a jumpsuit. And so I felt my transition was, was fantastic. That, that was a great way of, um, of easing me out of, of that sort of military mindset. And a lot of, of my role uh, commanding the team was dealing with commercial organizations. Uh, we had to discuss branding, uh, licensing, uh, different sponsorship deals. So I felt actually that was as good a, I suppose, uh, experience to set me up for, for a second career. Yeah, that certainly sounds like 
it's a step towards a civilian career rather than coming out of, straight out of a direct command position and going to work in a bank or something. <laughs> Absolutely. And but I got so much abuse from all my friends and peer group just every any time I saw them. And those were the worst displays jumping into any military uh, event because you just knew you would get so much abuse from uh, from friends for not doing a proper job. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a great transition. Yeah, that's possibly anyone who hasn't served in the military won't realize that actually uh, the amount of grief that people in the forces give to each other in a and and it's not malicious, but it's there, there's a constant barrage of what sounds like quite offensive abuse um, from from your closest friends. Absolutely, and I suppose that um, you know the, the sort of banter and the, the black humour, um, I suppose, I think reinforces that resilience. Um, you know, forget any training or going on operations. It's just the the day to day sort of camaraderie and all of that banter. You know, we give and take it uh, as as we can, and I think that just forges forges um, lifelong friendships. So when you left, uh, you'd got the the dog toy business um, uh, sort of as a fledgling business, that, that let's call it at the time. Uh, so what did you do next? So I realized that I I couldn't fund that that business. I couldn't make the, I was blown away by the, the demand. Um, I couldn't make them fast enough, but I needed a lot of capital. I'd extended all sorts of credit limits on um, on credit cards, uh, remortgaged my home, borrowed from friends and family, and, and couldn't make them fast enough. And um, that led to an experience in Dragon's Den. I then did a, a licensing deal with um, uh, a company called Kong, um, the world's largest uh, producer of dog toys. Uh, they, they do cat toys as well. But um, that was a great experience. And I, I think looking back was, was just the right exit um, for the uh, for safe sticks, I then moved around a little bit. Worked at a startup tandem skydiving operation, having had so much experience in the skydiving world. Uh, that was that was fun. But I I was looking for I think something more substantial, and actually looking for a, for a corporate job. I thought about starting another business, but I wasn't really sure what. But it was um, I suppose serendipitous that through a friend got introduced to the CEO of a a large. A uh, Japanese-owned multinational who was looking for someone with a bit of a military background, and so that led me into a corporate job for almost five years. And uh, what what did you do in that role? I started off as a as a project manager. Um, I was then given um, responsibility for a couple of teams, and that led very quickly into running the marketing and innovation for uh, the whole of Europe, which I suppose was a great match with what I was interested in, and also a little bit of um, that experience of, of bringing a, a new product to market. So it was, again, a fantastic experience. I had a couple of teams of seriously bright people in, um, in the sort of product design um, and innovation categories and a marketing team with uh, a really healthy budget. So great experience. I had the CEO was fantastic as a mentor. And um, yeah, I learned a lot over those five years. Do you think there was, uh, there was a lot that you could take from your time in the army to help you do well in that corporate role. Absolutely, um, and we might, you know, come back to this about um, other companies employing veterans. Any military training or any time that, that we spend in um, in the services, uh, as you know, you know those transferable skills are fantastic. Whether it's teamwork, communication, resilience, resourcefulness, and actually that's why that um, company recruited me. They had a lot of seriously bright people. But as the CEO said at the time, they couldn't organize chaos on a sinking submarine. So wanted someone to bring you know, a little bit of military planning and rigor and, and discipline um, to some of their training. Actually, we were maybe three months in, or I was three months into that job, and the company was, um, was doing some uh, training courses for some of their middle managers. And the third part of that course was um, out in the New Forest, where everyone would spend a couple of nights um, sleeping under a basha and uh, I'm doing various training exercises and I was standing there with the friend who who got me the job who did the introduction and the CEO and a couple of ex-military types um, it was getting dark we were standing around with head torches on um, just about to spend the night in the forest eating um, uh, food out of a bowl in the bag um, and my friend asked me how my transition to a corporate career was going. <laughs> well, actually, well, yeah, not very far at the time. But um, yeah, that was just one aspect. Most of the time was spent um, you know, in a, 
in an office behind a desk. So you mentioned an experience on Dragon's Den. Do you want to do tell a little bit more about that? Yeah, it was a great experience. I've been watching the show for uh, a couple of years. And um, because I couldn't generate the cash to produce enough dog toys to meet that demand, I was looking at any and all sorts of options. So I applied to the Dragon's Den. I was amazed that uh, I got picked up, went down for a screen test. Um, that was fine. And then got a, a date for the show. And slightly different set to, to what they use now. But at the time, there was a spiral staircase. And I mentioned my two little Jack Russells. I knew that with a dog toy, I had to take a dog on. But um, the, yeah, the Jack Russells would not have um, I think performed well. So I, I hired a, a trained dog. And everyone gets about 10 minutes. Everyone who's pitching gets about 10 minutes on the set before anyone arrives just to familiarize themselves with walking up the uh, spiral staircase. So I was going to lead the dog up the staircase with a, a safe stick in its mouth. We were going to do a little turn at the top, uh, walk into the center onto our, our mark and um, pitch to the dragons. That went amazingly well um, for two rehearsals. So come uh, the time, all well, the dragons are there. Um, obviously what you don't see when you're watching the show is down that left-hand side, um, just all the cameras, lights, uh, all the production team. Um, so yeah, naturally a little bit nervous. We started up the spiral staircase. We got to the top, the dog missed its step, uh, got tangled up in my feet, dropped the safe sticks. I bent it down, it was covered in dog spit. And just within 10 seconds, I just was had this image of me crashing and burning and it was, it was just going so very rapidly. Uh, I managed to untangle myself from, uh, from the lead and the dog and we ended up sort of at some point, you know, back in the middle of the, uh, the sort of stage. Thankfully, they didn't screen any of that, but within sort of 10 seconds, I managed to, I suppose, compose myself and, and start into my pitch, which I'd, I think, rehearsed about a thousand times. But it was, it was a great experience. I got some interesting feedback. I thought I might get a bit of interest from one of the dragons, four of them at the time, owned dogs. And so, yeah, there were some interesting questions. But uh, I think my business model, and um, certainly at the time, I was a little bit naive and there were too many people in the supply chain. I didn't know at the time, but I was getting ripped off massively. I, I found out further down the line. But um, certainly the, the financials weren't that attractive at the time. So I got a little bit of pushback from the dragons. I was told by Hilary DeVay at the time that I was stupid. Um, Duncan Bannatyne told me I would never sell any, um, which if anything, I was disappointed leaving without investment. But I think those words were ringing in my ears and I think just reinforced my my attitude. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, um, whenever I sell my millionth unit, I'm going to send you each a special edition just to go, there you go, how's that? <laughs> which I did. <laughs> Did they reply? I didn't get a reply. No, um, actually, you know, from Deborah Meadham, uh, I did get some replies on on Twitter. Uh, she was actually, uh, yeah, very funny about it, and yeah, wished us all the best. That's really cool. It must have been quite satisfying when you were when when you were signing the deal with Kong, after having like the, these very high profile investors on TV saying it's not going to work. Yes, exactly. And as I say, um, you know, I I could have let that advice or feedback get to me but I was just I think my being stubborn at the time and and realizing that actually we had plenty of customers and yeah. for that single some single fact that we were struggling to meet demand uh, I think just spurred me on so yeah it was hugely satisfying I was really lucky to um, meet Kong um, I was a bit of a punt flying to the states going to a big pet expo and walking straight up and, and pitching to um uh, they were my first port of call, so yeah, very satisfying and really lucky to um, to do that deal with them. So that that knockback uh, from uh, from the dragons, then, uh, but still carrying on. That I think that's a, a testament to the resilience piece that uh, you would have got from your from your military career. I think that, and maybe a bit of stubborn stupidity sort of thrown in, but yeah, I think you know that whole resilience piece of if we are either training or in operations. We're not going to have all the resources uh, we want. Time might be against us. And it's just a case of, well, you've got to get on and, and do the job, do the task in hand. And I think that translates really well into the entrepreneurial world where we're always you know, short of time or money or, or whatever it might be. And so, yeah, let's get on and, and make things happen. So uh, I remember when we were chatting before and you told me about uh, 
bit of guerrilla marketing that, uh, that that you'd undertaken while you were trying to um, promote safe sticks. That's right. That yeah. Bit? So we were maybe a year into um, having launched the uh, the company, and I had plenty of stock on hand. I was just trying to um, maximize sales. I didn't have enough money to take a stand at Crufts, but um, was managed to find a company that would uh, would partner with me and let me have um, a little section of their their booth. And so um, we had a couple of um, little retail stands with uh, dog toys on them. I'd been talking to um, a guy called Mark Abraham, who's a bit of a, a celebrity vet and just, <laughs> I think, again, serendipity, uh, played a part, managed to catch him at the right time on Twitter and he was doing a little bit on for Crufts TV. A camera crew came walking around the corner, I lights on my face and, and managed to start talking uh, with the dog toy. Anyway, um, I thought, okay, when that goes out the next day, that'll, that'll generate a little bit of demand, hopefully. But um, I remember, I can't remember where I, I read the story, but I thought, well, let's get ahead of um, everyone else in the, in the marketing and the, uh, the, the competition for eyeballs at Crufts. And you know, when you go into any exhibition, you're sort of bombarded with leaflets and flyers and all sorts of banner ads. But I thought, I'll start at the car park um, with a couple of sticks of chalk and I literally walked from every car park and wrote on the ground, obviously, thankfully it wasn't raining, but wrote on the ground just a little thing about safe stakes, find them at this stand and maybe another 100 metres, did the same message again. It took me a couple of hours to go from every car park on every footpath, but on every, um, I like to think that generated a lot of interest, but whenever the, um, whenever Crufts opened, there was a queue around the block for people wanting to buy a dog toy. And so, yeah, I think as for me, that was a great lesson of, of any little guerrilla marketing trick. It doesn't have to cost any money or it can be as inexpensive um, as you can make it. But I think it's just, you know, uh, comes down to using your imagination to, to capture eyeballs and, and attention. Improvise, adapt, overcome. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a drop a little cliche in there. Yeah. Uh, so then uh, you say you uh, you basically just doorstepped Kong at a show. Yes, I might have broken a rule or two, um, but went to um, a large pet expo in uh, in the States, um, took in a, a dog toy, I had a list of all the, the major uh, dog toy manufacturers, went up to uh, Kong, who's the biggest, spoke to the first guy I saw, explained that I had a dog toy that was selling really well in the UK and uh, would they like to talk about it? He put a, a grandfatherly arm around my shoulder and said, step this way. Turns out he was the president of the company. <laughs> I didn't know. Um, we went and had a chat and I think six weeks later, yeah, we had hammered out a deal and and that was that. And was that a, a, a life-changing moment for you when, when you did that deal? It was certainly significant. Um, I clearly starting any business, you put your uh, life and, and soul into it. So Safe Sticks was my baby. I felt like a concerned parent handing over that that child that I'd nurtured for the last few years. And yeah, it was looking back, it, it was the right, absolutely the right thing to do. I was a little bit uncertain at the time, um, but it worked out really well. It just all the financial pressure and I was in yeah, a fair amount of personal debt at the time that I'd used to fund the business. So, um, yeah, mixed emotions, but it was, um, there was a lot of relief there, but I suppose personal satisfaction. And that was, yeah, about 10 years ago and, and safe stakes are still selling well. So yeah, thank you, Kong. And so from when you, uh, when you signed that deal, you went from you running everything that safe sticks did to taking a, a much smaller role. So in the sort of immediate period after that, what did you do? I was working at that um, tandem skydiving startup uh, based on a Wiltshire. So that was occupying my, occupying my time. I was looking for a corporate job. So sending out lots of CVs, um, thinking about other business ideas. I had a couple of other ideas, but zero money to to do anything with them. So um, yeah, that, that was probably about a year of... Not being in limbo, I, I still, I was reading widely, I was networking, I was just trying to do everything to, I think, set myself up for whatever came next. So since then, you've you've founded more companies? Yes. Um, property, I fell into that. Um, actually, that goes back to 
about 2007 when a friend of mine, also ex-military, she is a financial advisor um, specializing in mortgages. And uh, we thought we would set up a company to offer uh, mortgage advice specifically to um, uh, serving soldiers, their families and, and veterans. Again, based on personal experience, I had enough money at that time to buy my first property. And I remember um, not having a clue what the mortgage broker was telling me. Um, I got a solicitor, didn't have a clue what they were telling me either, signed a load of documents, probably didn't fully understand <laughs> the, uh, the significance of some of the terms I was, I was signing up to. So uh, we, we set up a company called Armed Forces Financial Services. Um, she's definitely the brains behind that. Um, lots of experience with lenders who um, can understand a BFPO address history because for a lot of us, if you spend time on, on big camps, um, the average uh, credit check will not recognize that um, you live on a camp with a thousand other people and, and will uh, give you a negative uh, credit rating as a result. So we set that up, uh, that's still going strong, and um, we I dabbled a little bit in property. But then I suppose my um, biggest challenge over the last three years after that corporate job was um, getting into the world of wearable technology. And so what, what, what was the problem you were looking to solve? Yet again, based on personal experience, I was on a skiing trip with a friend and on day three, the joke is he very selfishly injured himself. Uh, in fact, he tore his ACL doing this jump, which he shouldn't have been doing. He definitely didn't have the, the talent to, uh, to pull that off, but uh, it was selfish because it meant I had to ski by myself for the rest of the trip. So Billy No Mates, listening to music, um, but I found that when I wanted to skip a track or even adjust the volume on the headphones that were underneath my, my helmet, I couldn't, with a sort of gloved hand, get to one of the little buttons. So I had to stop, take a glove off, reach inside my jacket, get my phone out to do that operation. And it struck me that there was no better wearable tech or anything that would let you do that that quite easily. So that was, I suppose, the um, the start of the idea. And um, it's been a three year process to design, develop a bit of tech, which turned into a smart ring. Um, and we've just launched that uh, in the last couple of weeks. From the point of having the idea from your, your, your skiing holiday, did you then socialize that idea with friends and say, what do you think? Would you buy this? Or did you just go, no, nope, I believe lots of people have this problem. I'm gonna go ahead and do it. More, more of the latter. Um, yeah, I think friends and family are a good sounding board. Um, invariably, they will often be kind and say, yeah, that's a great idea. You should go a little bit further. Some of my friends, I suppose, swing the opposite way and, and will be absolutely brutal and say, no, that is the most stupid idea I've ever heard. So um, I, I took a sort of mix of that, that advice, but I did try and speak to others. I did a design sprint. So I left the corporate job. That was my... Um, uh, motivation to so, leave that corporate job. So you go, I've had this idea, I'm going to run with it, I'm quitting my job. Yep. Okay. Bold? Yes, or stupid, you could argue. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the two or somewhere in between. Uh, so I got a, an agency involved and did a design sprint because originally I, I felt the idea could be risk-based. But it came out from that and we had a, a blind focus group at the end of that and I think that little bit of feedback from some of those people was that, yes, that there is a um, the basis of an idea here. It's not entirely stupid. Um, it's probably ring-based as opposed to sitting on your wrist. So that was enough, I think, for me just to take another risk. Um, clearly, I had to, to brief the wife. Um, she, thankfully, was very supportive and said, yep, if you... If this is what you're passionate about, if this is going to make you happy, because I was getting a little bit, uh, I suppose, restless in that corporate job. And so she was thankfully hugely supportive. And so we launched into that and that was three years ago. And so then from your journey with Safe Sticks, how much of that helped you with the, uh, the wearable? A huge this? amount. I mentioned before that I was naive at the time. Um, Manufacturing in China, shipping products internationally, um, just all the rules and regulations, finances, bureaucracy, but more into the you know the product design. My experience with that corporate job was was hugely beneficial, um, but a 
wearable technology product, hugely more complex than, than a rubber dog toy. So um, I realized I wasn't going to be able to do this on my own. Um, found, um, met a, a CTO who had experience in the, in the sector. And so we, we joined forces pretty quickly, probably three or four months um, into, uh, into the process. So yeah, we, Kumar has been on board ever since then and, and brought all of his experience, contacts and, and industry knowledge with him. And so then uh, that, that that process of three years, and you say um, just to, you launched just a couple of weeks ago. Yes. So it was well, I don't know what the the sort of rule of thumb is on on launching a product, but um, it took us three times as long and cost twice as much. Um, throw COVID into the mix and a lockdown. Um, the the restrictions on funding, uh, it turned into an absolute slog. I think that, that probably every startup founder will say the same thing. Yes, it was a slog, lots of ups and downs, lots of frustrations, lots of challenges, running out of money more than once, almost having to fold at one point because we just couldn't make things work. We couldn't um, get past the um, some of the, the product issues in, in particular, but we, we persevered, um, got some fantastic... Angel investors on board, very supportive, and and just again, I suppose stubbornness, resilience, bloody mindedness pushed on through. Um, we had some great backers, so we launched a, a Kickstarter and also a campaign on Indiegogo. So that was a huge boost and um, immensely satisfying. Two weeks ago, to write to all of those backers to say that thank you for keeping the faith, but uh, your product is being shipped. It'll be with you next week. And we've had some amazing responses from, from a lot of those backers who finally got, got the product they supported. So they've got it in hand now. Yeah, I've got it in hand. So being and used in the real world. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I, I saw a photo of yours uh, with uh, a lot of boxes in your kitchen currently. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and yeah, I did a little... Um, uh, sort of post on that it, it reminded me back in the day with i think it was the second shipment of safe sticks five thousand units arrived um into uh, into my house and they're in the garage occupying sort of two or three rooms i'd unbox them all because i'd uh, relabel them and uh, and ship them out and i thought um and actually i was still serving at the time so every afternoon once i finished work i got home i would box up all the customer orders that day take them down to the post office and ship them out and just day after day and most of my weekends spent doing that and I, I swore to myself never again. Anyway, move forward <laughs> 10 years and um, just looking at the financials um, and I suppose it goes back to just being frugal and, and resourceful but I wanted to pay for a fulfillment company just to take all the logistics um, off my hands but I thought, well actually I, I can do this myself. I can do it again and um, it will save us a lot of money. And actually, it's been fantastic. So talking to customers, you know, sending uh, mostly automated emails out, the tracking numbers, getting direct feedback from customers yeah, has been fantastic. I would like to think that once we uh, grow or when we grow and the volume of orders get to get to get gets to the stage where I can pass it on to a fulfillment company, that'll be great. But for now, I, my, my kitchen is the ops room and... <laughs> I've got to get back and push some more out today. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, have you, you've bought one with you today? I have. Never leave home without one. Uh, so comes a little product pack. Uh, this is the tech, which is interchangeable through a whole different um, series of, of different sized uh, rings. These are all stretch fit, so you can wear them on a finger or over the top of a glove. Or you can swap this into a handlebar mount. So if you're cycling or on a rowing machine, you can, and you don't want to wear the ring on your finger, you can attach it so it sits just beside your hand and you can control the joystick with your thumb. Uh, obviously giving you the hard sell, what else can I say? <laughs> uh, super light, so it's less than 10 grams, five days battery, life out of it, 20 days on standby. Um, it will connect in seconds to, to your smartphone and will start controlling your playlist straight away or we've got an app and you can do uh, a lot more with the app. That's really cool. If anyone who's listening or watching is interested in buying one, how do they go and buy one? So our website is arcx.fit, so A-R-C-X dot F-I-T. Fantastic. So uh, it, it sounds like you've had uh, quite a, an interesting and exciting time uh, post-military 
But uh, there's the, there's one more thing I'd like to uh, pick up on from your time in the military. So you were awarded a Distinguished Service Order. Do you want to tell us the story behind that? Um, I think a, a lot of it was down to one particular day, uh, the 26th of June, uh, 2006, when I was I led a patrol with um, it was a, a platoon of uh, Royal Irish Regiment soldiers who were attached to, to my company, um, and um, a lot of Parachute Regiment soldiers. Also on the patrol was uh, Christina Lamb, a Sunday Times journalist, and Duncan Sutcliffe, a photographer. And it was supposed to be a routine patrol. We went into an area uh, near Goresh that we hadn't been to before, so we were just extending slightly outside um, our area of, uh, of operations that we had already covered. And uh, I suppose to cut a long story short, what was supposed to be just a meet and greet, talking to uh, to the local uh, village elders, um, turned into yeah quite a cheeky little situation. Um, on leaving that village, we were um, attacked by a number of Taliban. That number grew until there were sort of 25 to 30 Taliban surrounding us. Uh, we were in a particularly difficult uh, piece of ground. We had lots of irrigation ditches to cross. Um, before we met up with the vehicles that had dropped us off, it was a, a deliberate decision to go to that area, knowing that we were outside of artillery range. Uh, when we called for air support, uh, we were told that there was another situation going on further up the Sangin Valley, and uh, there were no helicopters or fast air support um, available for us. So one of those, I think, uh, life-defining moments, a uh, big swallow, um, and realised actually now I need to raise my game and come up with a plan to get us out of this, what was a 360-degree battle. So hasty plan, brief the, the, the troops, and, and off we went, and that turned into a two-hour uh, fighting withdrawal across pretty challenging ground. And to this day, I say that you know, I don't know how we got out of that without um, any casualties. I know exactly why it was down to just the courage, resilience, um, skill level uh, of every everyone involved. So we, we fought our way out of that, um, got reunited with our vehicles and, and got back to camp with nothing more than, than cuts and bruises. Um, no casualties on our side, different story uh, on the Taliban side. So that was a significant event, but then um, through the rest of the tour, we had a further 46 um, contacts in various sort of shapes or forms, uh, shape or form, before um, we then you know, recovered back to the UK. That's, that's quite the story. So then when you take the severity of a situation like that to then Duncan Bannatyne telling you you can't sell dog toys, uh, there's, yeah, it's easy to see how you brush one off. Yeah, I think so. I think any time in the military, um, not necessarily in operations, I think instills that, yeah, is it, is it resilience? Is it stubbornness? Maybe a degree of confidence. Um, some of it is not taking ourselves too seriously. But um, yeah, certainly with, with a small team and, and both in the, the startup world and in the corporate world, my sort of adage is if things get, get tough and Obviously, they do. The pressure's on. Um, I've used the line quite often to the rest of the team. Look, okay, no one's no one's going to get killed. No one's getting pregnant as a, as a result of this. Let's everyone take a breath. It's not that serious. Okay, and let's figure out what we're going to do. One of the things I, I've really enjoyed, um, and even post military, is the the community aspect that you you get from having been part of that. Um, and uh, it, it seems there's a lot of people out there that. That try to give back into that community. Do you want to talk to uh, talk to us a little bit about what you've done in that space? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm I'm very uh, keen to uh, to give back as much as I can. So I've been involved with um, Heropreneurs, um, which is a, a charity set up exclusively, specifically for um, to help those who are transitioning out of the military and who want to start up their own business. So for anyone who's got an idea to, to start their own business, Heropreneurs is a, is a fantastic um, charity to help them out. There are lots of other charities, uh, focus groups, forums, um, chat groups. You and I met at, um, at a, a drinks event uh, in London. Um, LinkedIn, there are a lot of great um, uh, 
uh, groups on there. So I think it's just a case of um, doing a little bit of research, doing a bit of digging, um, asking to join these groups. You'll be invited with open arms and there's a lot of great advice out there. I certainly made no end of mistakes. Certainly the safe sticks, still making mistakes. Um, but I think more now than, uh, than in the past with my experience, there's lots of people that you can um, get advice from, even if it's just to have a bit of a vent, um, to get a second opinion on something. Um, it's just a case of, of asking. And um, yeah, there are a lot of people very keen um, out there to, uh, to give back what they can. So the, uh, the group that I, I met you at, um, I, I found that to be, such a fascinating uh, fascinating group and it was um it was after um going to the first drinks uh, for that that i started putting together the idea that actually this podcast could be a really cool thing to do because um you know who, who would know uh, when they're coming up to the end of their time in in the army that someone left the army and went on to be the coo of google in europe or someone sold six million dog toys or do you know what I mean? People people don't know these stories, and um, I think it can it can often cause people to aim low, um, and I don't think there's any need for people to aim low. I think people can leave military service and do amazing things, um, and I would absolutely encourage that. Absolutely, and us being veterans, there are so many other veterans out there with uh, with a lot of um, world-class experience, having built businesses, worked in businesses, sold businesses, and anyone who's leaving, all they have to do is, and you can find most of this, LinkedIn is a great resource, drop us a line, and um, yeah, you know, most of the time, very happy to, with that military connection, um, answer a question, or if we don't know the answer, uh, introduce you to someone else. So it's just a case of, yeah, reaching out and asking. So uh, it, it's been it's been fascinating to hear your your story today, and um, if you were to give a piece of advice to someone who's just coming into their last twelve months in the army, what would what would you advise them? I think firstly have have the confidence that their their skills and experience and, and talent is valued by a lot of civilian employers. Sadly, there are some that, that just see a military um, entry on a CV and, and kind of dismiss it out of hand. But however long they've spent in the services, they've learned a huge amount that will stand them in, in good stead. Whether they want to go into the corporate world or if they want to start a business, yeah, clearly there are some big decisions. But, but starting a business, I think there's so many attributes, um, soft skills and, and an attitude that we get from a, a military um, career that, that lend themselves so well to the entrepreneurial world. So if they've got an idea to start a business, um, don't go into it with romantic views that it's going to be easy and you're going to hit unicorn status within 12 months and be, have a yacht of part of um, Saint-Tropez. Um, if you're not, it's a long slog challenging but hugely rewarding so if they want to start their own business there are lots of mm. forums um help groups um charities out there that that are geared to to give them advice um heropreneurs who i've been involved with as a mentor for the last 18 months i'm really passionate about if they want to start their own business get in touch with the charity they can get a mentor who can offer a bit of advice and guidance and steer them in the right direction but uh, i suppose my coming back to uh, that one piece of advice is, yeah, you know, leave with your your head held high and and launch yourself into your second career, whatever that might be. Brilliant, um, Paul. Thanks very much for coming on today. It's been uh, it's been great chatting to you. Thanks for having me, Nick. Yeah, great to talk. Thanks for listening. I'm sure you'll agree the stories from the guests on the show are incredible. Starting your own company is an incredibly brave and difficult thing to do. And there's a theme of resilience through all these stories, which is key to success as an entrepreneur. If you're a veteran with a good story to tell, we'd love to have you on. If you're leaving the military and you want to get in touch, email podcast at littlebigtech.co.uk. If you run a business and you're looking for an IT company that's entrepreneurial and forward thinking, please do get in touch. I hope you enjoy the rest of the series.